So I'm Mark Doyle. Uh, I've emailed, I think, with a good chunk of you at some point. Um, if I haven't, it's not a reflection on you, it's a reflection on me. Uh, so don't worry about that. Um, oh, and I'm Brian McGlynn, uh, another faculty here in the Nicholas School. Watershed Hydrology, Biochemistry. And, and I do river science uh, and stuff like that. Um, and so I've been uh, directing the water program for a while now. I was on leave up until not too long ago, and Brian kind of managed things while I was gone, and now Brian's gone. And uh, so, or Brian's gone for, uh, he's been gone for a little while. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so people come in and out, and we've got a few new faces that have come in to help support the program. So it's, yeah, it's growing, it's big. Yep. Um, so anyway, uh, the goal I think that we have today is to give you a little bit of a description about the water program. Um, you've got a few uh, resources that are better than me and Brian to give you some real insight into the program. The, the current students will at least be honest, um, and so that will be helpful. Um, but the water program generally is built around the basic science of hydrology. Um, and so both Brian and I are trained as hydrologists, but in addition to that, we branch out into a lot of other kinds of things. Um, so. Uh, my career has taken me into um, uh, finance and policy and working a lot with the Department of Interior and working a lot with some of the private sector. Um, Brian's career has taken him into coastal hydrology and biogeochemistry as well. Yeah, so biogeochemistry, water quality, land use change effects, getting into more um, disturbance and things that go with it. But making sure first you start with a fundamental understanding of how and why water moves in the environment. One thing, Brian actually also came out of a forestry kind of a background as well. So thinking as a forest hydrologist and managing big landscapes about hydrology. Um, Sorry, you're uh, yeah. Are we doing okay so far? Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. Um, so one thing that you'll notice in the program is that uh, the we have a, the water program because water itself is a very uh, broad discipline, and going into water management is very broad as well. Uh, you'll see that the program itself is um, structured but unstructured. So we kind of have buckets of kinds of things that you might look at going into in terms of classes and careers without specifying which classes you would actually take. So for example, on the science side, uh, there are three uh, science-y requirements. So a physical water kind of a class, a biological or ecological kind of a water class, and a chemical water kind of a class. Um, the gateway class that a lot of students take um, as soon as you walk in the door is uh, called landscape hydrology. Like yeah. Talking about that. yeah, of course I teach again to make sure we all have a fundamental understanding of what happens when it rains, where does the water go, um, how much goes back to the atmosphere, what controls that, how much makes it to the river, um, and what the effects of vegetation, land use change, people on those processes. And that way we all have a fundamental understanding and we have a language starting point as you move on and talk about other things in hydrology and maybe get into rivers and geomorphology. At least you know how the water got into the river. Yep, so that's kind of the gateway. This is how things start. Where does water come from, kind of a thing. Um, from there, the, on the biological side, there's a stream ecology class that Jim Heffernan teaches. Um, there's a wetlands ecology class that uh, uh, Kurt Richardson teaches. And one thing that you'll see is that there are a lot of intersections. So Kurt Richardson's class, for example, counts as, could count as either a biological <coughs> class or a chemical class, because one thing that you'll discover as you go into some of these, that the difference between biology and chemistry is actually somewhat arbitrary sometimes. Um, and so on the chemistry side, uh, there are classes by Admir Vingosh, who teaches a class in groundwater hydrology, and that's looking at uh, groundwater hydrology through the lens of international relations. So especially Israel-Palestine, a lot of Middle Eastern conflict driven by groundwater relationships. Um, and then one thing to keep in mind is that uh, Duke is a big place, but also one of the unusual advantages that we have here is that there are three schools that are here uh, pretty close. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill is about six miles away, and there's a bus that runs every 30 minutes. And so you actually have access to any class that's taught at UNC Chapel Hill or NC State. Um, and usually, I think, second, usually second year students will take a UNC class, um, uh, usually they'll take at least one or something like that. So if you're interested in land use change and those kinds of things, UNC has a Department of City and Regional Planning that's uh, very well known, and so you might want to learn how planners think about roads and road networks and things like that. Um, there's also uh, the, the Department of Geology, the Department of Environmental Engineering and things like that over there, and we also have the Department of Environmental Engineering and Civil Engineering here at Duke, and we have classes that are taught over there that some of our students will hop into as well. Yeah, and NC State's farther away, but there's a wealth of um, resources there also. So even if it's just going down for a seminar for the day, or deciding that that time commitment's worth it for a particular thing that you'd like for your future. So those are all um, options you can take. Yeah. So uh, those are on the science side. So the other thing that you'll see is that we have um, the other aspects of water management, are things like law and policy, economics and uh, finance, um, and then general electives kind of a thing. So you might just get interested in weird stuff. 
So uh, my first year here, I had a student who got inordinately fascinated <coughs> by hard rock mining. And so she ended up taking almost every class that had to do with minerals and mining. Uh, and when you think about mining, a lot of mining is based on land use leases. And so she ended up taking real estate and leasing classes over the business school in order to learn about how to do a lot of these mining types of activities. Um, so uh, again, it's kind of, what we try to do is to say, uh, you need to know, it's kind of like, it's almost like at the beginning, it's like a liberal arts training where you take a range of different types of classes to build your foundation, like Brian was saying. And then uh, along with that, both on the science side as well as on the, the management policy economic side. But then one of the other things that we really try to make sure that you do is develop a toolkit. And that's really where, to be honest, a lot of the, the students Present company included really struggle is what I want my toolkit to be, you know. And some of the examples, uh, one of the big ones that's always been here at, uh, at Duke has been GIS, so geospatial analysis. Um, and so for that, uh, how many of the first years are doing GIS certificate? Okay. So the, what we do at Duke is we really uh, we put you through the ringer in the first semester, and so we put you into Pat Halpin's class. It's the Intro to GIS class. Um, and it's kind of hazing, right? So we just kind of <laughs> uh, beat you up for a period of time with, um, we call it GIS, and it's mainly just beating you up intellectually for a solid semester. Uh, but when you come out of there, you have an inordinately well-honed toolkit that allows the students to go into the coastal GIS program, the water GIS program, the conservation GIS, so all of these different routes that you can go from there. And within the water program, we have Mukesh Kumar, who teaches the water GIS class specifically, as well as water modeling classes. Um, so GIS is kind of, uh, it's a backbone kind of application that a lot of uh, water management jobs either have or <coughs> have an expectation for, um, although that's changing a lot, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, no, so it's not that you have to do that, but it, it prepares you for a certain aspect. It becomes like, you know, you're using a word processor for some positions, and even on the research side, spatial analysis is just another one of those things like a word processor. Same goes for statistics and time series analysis or other um, analytical tools. Uh, you can use these as a toolkit, but they also, depending upon the position, are just one of those things that you might use every day. So one of the things that we find is that students, uh, depending on the student, will try to avoid some of the harder classes, to be quite honest. I mean, grad school can be fun. Um, it shouldn't be, but it can be. Um, but uh, so one thing we find is, well, that's a heavy mathematical class. And so students tend to avoid that. And then what we almost always find is in the last semester, they say, I wish I'd have kept taking quant classes, or I wish I'd have ta kept taking chemistry classes. But um, you can often uh, take short courses in a lot of things. You just can't take short courses later in your career on how to do math. Um, and so, and how to do kind of hard analysis, hard chemistry kinds of things. So um, I will always, if you ever end up in my office asking for advice, God forbid, I will always pound you, you know, keep, you know, take another hard quant class, take another hard analytical class, um, and it, it's just going to be one of those kinds of right. things. An example of that is the course I teach is, is less um, numerical, and it's a lot more concepts and process, how do things work, and making sure it has a good conceptual and fundamental understanding. And Gabby Katul teaches a follow-up class that you're going to be coding things that I talked about and you hopefully understand the process. Now you're going to be writing code to represent those building small models. It's an example of an analytical class built on top of a conceptual foundation. So even if you don't end up using the actual models that you learn in Gabby's class, the ability to, to do that stuff just becomes invaluable, that you actually know how to do a lot of this analysis. Um, the other thing is, is the quantitative space and the toolkit space is changing way too fast to keep up with. I mean, it used to be, um, I don't know what people use SAS and a lot of the a lot of the other programs now. Almost everything in the natural sciences is you do a lot of your basic work in Excel and then flipping over to R is the new. Basically, everything is done in R in R for big databases. And so we really try to push students to get familiar with it, so that whenever you show up on the first day of work and they say, "Here's here's what we use," you can at least fake it for the first week or so, right? That you can that you can you'll be able to ramp up. And one thing that you find with software and these kinds of analytical techniques is. Each one's a little bit different, but they're all kind of the same. And so being, you know, if you're faced with MATLAB, which Gabby teaches, but then you flip over into R, you at least get the general idea of how these types of things work. Um, so there's, the, the toolkits can vary tremendously. A lot of the way that I advise my students is, um, if, it's, if the toolkit doesn't make, like GIS is clearly a toolkit. Lab <coughs> methods or uh, uh, lab methods or field methods might be a toolkit for a specific thing. But there's also these kind of unusual toolkits where you may really, you know, there may be something different. I really want to learn about satellite technology, you know, with grace satellites and those kinds of new emerging techniques. Remote sensing may be your toolkit. But it's one of those where I'd like, you know, propose one to your academic advisor and say, I think that this is a distinct toolkit, and so that's what I'm going to do. 
Yeah, this is an important part, I think Martin will talk about in a minute, is you're going to sit down and build a program, and it can evolve over time as you learn more and, and get new insight, but that you are creating a program that will prepare you for your next step. So there's a framework that uh, is somewhat flexible, it has some core that you need to take, but from that you personalize it and with your faculty advisor. Yep, we figure you're here for a reason, you're an adult, um, and so you've chosen to come to grad school, you've chosen to make a decision to leave whatever it was you were uh, going to be doing and come here, and so I kind of, I'm going to try to treat you like an adult, make big decisions, uh, and we'll kind of guide you in that direction. We'll make suggestions, but I'm not going to necessarily hold your feet to the fire to make the decision that I would make. Mine's the best decision, <laughs> but it's not. So, But you have the hard questions, you know, you come in and you say, this is what I'd like to do, and we'd say, well, why? Show me that that's the right thing for you to do, and just sort of be a little bit critical to make sure that this is truly the right thing for you to do, or the best thing. And we'll push you a lot, I mean, alum, your alumni network, which will eventually be uh, these folks, um, that's one of the best resources to tap into, and you'd be shocked at how willing they are to talk to you. Um, so people five years, 10 years, 20 years out, who are in careers doing interesting things, he, uh, what we'll do is randomly say, well, I'm kind of interested in this, and I'll happen to know somebody who does that, and say, oh, you should call. You should just call this person and get 15 minutes while they're driving home or something and just see what do they think about the types of classes. And they often still know the professors who are floating around the hallways. They're like, oh, God, don't take that. Um, but it's a, it's a phenomenal resource, not just for finding a job, but for negotiating and navigating grad school itself. Yeah, they would love to talk to you.